Welcome to Learn This Game, where you can learn about board games and how they are played. Today, we'll be looking at Rifles in the Ardennes. In this video, there will be a general description and overview of the game. We'll inventory the components, and we'll go through gameplay, including setup, sample turns, and victory conditions. Lastly, we'll review any accessories you may find helpful for this game. In the description, there'll be some helpful links and a timestamp index so you can navigate directly to any part of the presentation. If you want to skip this introduction and go straight to the game setup and gameplay, you can go to the timestamp index now in the description. And if you find this video helpful, please like, subscribe, and share. You can also leave a comment to let us know what game you'd like to see reviewed. Or if you have this game, let everyone know if this is one you'd recommend. Rifles in the Ardennes was first published in 2017 by Tiny Battle Publishing and was designed by Guitar Dose and Connie. The publisher link will be in the description so you can verify the current availability of the game. In this solitaire war game, you will be leading your American, German, or USSR squad to accomplish various missions in World War II Europe. The age recommendation is 12 and older. This is considered an easy game to play, and each mission averages about 1-2 to two hours in playtime. The game is designed for solo play only, and there is no multiplayer variant. There is no app required, and there are no apps available for this game. There are no expansions for this game, but there are other games in the Theaters of War series by the same designer including Rifles in the Pacific and Rifles in the Peninsula. This designer has published other games as well in different genres, including Blood in Space and Space Infantry Resurgence. If you enjoyed Rifles in the Ardennes, you may also enjoy these other historical war games, many of which can be played solitaire. And if you want to learn more about this period in World War II, there are many informative books available, including Battle, The Story of the Bulge, The Guns at Last Light, and The Longest Winter. Now that you've seen a brief description of the game, let's get into the game itself. This is a solitaire war game that uses a map, counters, and dice. Thematically, it's based on squad-level combat during World War II in the European theater involving soldiers from the United States, Germany, and the USSR. Now let's see how to successfully accomplish a mission. Each game is comprised of a mission, and there are eight missions to choose from. The objective is different for each mission and is listed on the top right of each mission briefing. In Mission 1, your soldiers will start just under Stripe 6 and have to reach Stripe 1 at the top of the map card. You lose the mission if all your units are eliminated or the turn track reaches zero. Now let's look at the components. Rifles in the Ardennes comes with the following a 14-page color rulebook, a briefing book of eight missions. Each mission will have its own objective and tables unique to that mission. An 8.5 by 11-inch map card divided into six sections called stripes. A unit roster card meant to be copied and written on. The unit roster is where you will list your soldiers and refer to the common tables needed for all of the missions. It also has the turn track at the bottom, which is the timer for the game. There is also a card showing squad examples for each of the three nations in the game. Each army also has its own army card which breaks down the units, their cost, and other information you will reference throughout each mission. There is an army sheet overview card which helps to explain the different parts of the army sheets. There are also 43 one inch unit counters and 42 administrative counters. US units are represented by green counters, Germany by the blue counters, and the USSR by light brown. You will also need five six-sided dice which are not included, and you will also need a container from which to draw certain counters during the game. This is also not included. Now let's set up a mission to see how the game is played. First, we'll select a mission from the mission book. We'll start with mission one. In the upper right corner of each mission is a description of the mission, the objective, number of turns, and setup instructions. The rest of the page has the tables we will need for this mission. Next, place the map card in front of you. The objective states that we must reach Stripe 1. Our units will be starting under the bottom of the map below Stripe 6, 
and will have to progress in this mission to the first stripe. We will then place the game marker on turn 10 of the unit roster card. The mission instructions then tell us to pick event markers 1 through 8 and place one randomly on each stripe. The back of each event marker has a question mark. You can draw these from a container or place them face down and shuffle them for randomness. Then place one on each stripe. The two unused event markers are not revealed and placed aside for the remainder of the mission. Next, we have to set up the terrain per the mission instructions. We'll use the terrain table for this mission and roll one six-sided die for each stripe, beginning with stripe one. For stripe one, we roll a two, which according to the terrain table leaves the stripe open. For stripe two, we roll a five, which indicates a woods terrain counter per the terrain table. For stripe three, we roll a one, which leaves the stripe open. For stripe four, we roll a six, which indicates a building placement. For stripe five, we roll a four, which requires us to place a tree counter. And for stripe six, we roll a two, which leaves the stripe open. There are two categories of terrain markers. If a marker has no red dot at the lower left corner, such as the woods counter, it is a base terrain marker and applies to the entire stripe and all of the units in that stripe. Unless otherwise specified, a terrain base marker always blocks the line of sight between other stripes. If the counter is a terrain feature, such as this building, it will have a red dot. These represent a specific element of terrain that can only provide cover to a limited number of units. These do not block the line of sight. Each terrain feature can only support one group of a maximum of four units on one side. Enemy units only occupy a terrain feature when instructed by the mission sheet. Our units can elect to move into a terrain feature by spending an action point. Units in the same or adjacent stripes can always see each other. Units two or more stripes apart can see each other if there are no base terrain markers between them. The final step in setting up the game is squad selection. First, we will select the army we will play and one enemy army. We will be the US Army playing against the Germans. The army sheet includes the information needed to play that army. Under the name of the nation are the maximum army points used to assign your squad and equipment. The cost to recruit each unit is listed on the far right of the table. Some missions may provide additional army points or specific unit types as attachments. The army sheet also lists the units, equipment, and various tables that will be used throughout the mission. Consulting the U.S. Army sheet, we will spend nine army points for the following units and spend one army point for six grenades for a total of 10 army points. Now let's clarify the terminology used as we assign our units. All of our soldiers comprise one squad. The soldiers are then divided into groups which move and fight together. The rulebook recommends maintaining a group size of three to four soldiers. Groups are more efficient than single units because it only takes one action point to activate an entire group. Finally, each individual soldier is referred to as a unit in the rulebook. In this mission, we are going to form two groups. Unit A will be the squad leader and be placed in group 1. Unit L will be the assistant squad leader and placed in group 2. The assistant leader becomes the leader if the original leader is eliminated. We will assign our six grenades to our rifleman units C, D, E, and F. A unit can only carry a maximum of two grenades. Our final step in the setup will be logging our units and equipment on the unit roster. In the friendly units box, we will list the AP cost, the unit name, designation, unit ID letter, and any equipment, in this case, the assigned grenades. The unit roster is especially useful for playing campaigns. Now let's look at some sample turns to see how a mission is executed. Each game turn consists of five steps. The game turns are also listed on the unit roster card for quick reference. Unless otherwise noted in the mission briefing, the squad will start in a staging area below stripe six just off the map card. We will now start the first game turn. Recall that we have 10 turns for our units to reach stripe one at the top of the map card. The first step is group creation. At the beginning of each turn, friendly units on the same stripe can be redeployed to form one or more groups of adjacent units. Groups can be activated as a single entity using one action point. You can also form groups before turn one. As mentioned, we have formed two groups led by units A and L. The next step is the friendly units activation. 
You can refer to the unit roster card for reference. This step involves rolling three six-sided dice that are referred to as action dice. We discard any result of one or two. A result of three through five provides one action point for the squad. A six provides one bonus action point. These can be spent as a regular action point, but they also provide extra effects for some actions. The effects are listed on the unit activation chart. In this turn, we roll a 1, 5, and 4. We can discard the 1, and the other two dice give us a total of 2 action points. The unit roster card lists the available actions and shows asterisk when bonus action points are used. During this step, we select one group and allocate one or more action points to execute one of the available actions. We repeat this until all of the action points have been used. Action points cannot be carried over to other turns. Regardless of the number of available action points, each unit can only attack once per turn. We will use our first action point to move our first group to stripe 6. When a group or unit enters a new stripe, the event marker is immediately revealed. In this case, we reveal the 1 marker and consult the event table on the mission page. In this mission, event 1 does not trigger any activity. Since we have one action point remaining, we will move our second group to stripe 6. Since the event marker was already revealed, we do not have to consult the event table again. Since there are no action points remaining, we will move on to the enemy presence check. If there are two or more enemy units already on the map, you can skip this step. If there are zero or one unit on the map, we have to roll one die and consult the enemy presence table on the mission sheet. This roll results in a 6. We then consult the patrol table on the German army sheet, which requires us to roll one more die. We roll a 1, which requires us to place one enemy rifle unit on the previous stripe. You can also log the enemy unit on the unit roster card. A reference to the previous stripe refers to the numerically preceding stripe, or the stripe just above the current stripe. In this case, stripe 5 precedes stripe 6, so we place a German rifle unit on stripe 5. The instructions do not indicate that the unit be placed attached to a terrain feature, so the unit does not have the benefit of being covered by the tree. The next step is the enemy forces activation. If enemy units are present on the map, we must roll one die for each enemy group and consult the enemy activation table on the mission sheet. In this case, we roll a four. The table states that the unit will attack a target group if in range. Looking at the German army sheet, we see that the rifle unit has a range of 1. Range 0 refers to any units in the same stripe. Range 1 refers to the stripe above or below the stripe currently occupied by the unit. Next, we refer to the target table on the mission sheet. The first section on the table is used to determine which group will be targeted. The second part of the table will then determine which unit in that group will be targeted. In this case, we roll a 2, which indicates the enemy unit will target our second group, which is the smaller group since it only has 3 units compared to group 1, which has 4 units. We then roll a 4. The table indicates the enemy will target our unit in group 2 with the lower target number. We can find the target numbers for our units by referencing the U.S. Army Sheet, which shows each of our units has a target number of 6, so we select one of the rifle units. The enemy rifle unit now attacks our targeted rifle unit. To execute an attack, each attacking unit rolls one die to determine the attack outcome. In order to calculate the results, first we take the die roll and then add the result of the attacking unit's combat factor and any die roll modifiers. To find the combat factor for the attacking unit, consult the attacking unit's army sheet. For this unit, the combat factor for the rifle unit is 1. To see the combat modifiers, we can refer to the table on the unit roster card, which shows the modifiers for the attacker and defender. In this case, no modifiers apply. So a die roll of 4 plus a 1 combat factor plus 0 modifiers equals a 5 attack roll. For the defending unit, we can take the target number, which we previously saw was 6 on the U.S. Army sheet, and apply any terrain or cover modifiers from the combat modifiers table on the unit roster card. In this instance, there are no modifiers for the defending unit. So the total target number is 6. Since the attacker's 5 is not equal to or greater than the defending 6, there is no effect. Since there are no more enemy units, we move to the last step of the game and advance the turn marker to 9. We now start the next turn. The first step is group creation. 
we can reform our units into new groups who occupy the same stripe. In this case, we will leave the current two groups intact. Next, we start the friendly unit's activation by rolling three action dice. The roll results in two fours and a two. Ones and twos are discarded and there are no sixes, so we are left with two action points to spend this turn. Once again, we consult the available actions on the unit roster card to review our choices. We now have some strategic decisions to make. In order to increase our chances of eliminating the German rifle unit, we could spend both action points on flanking fire, which would give us a plus one modifier to our attacking dice rolls. However, we have to keep in mind that we only have nine more turns to reach Stripe 1. So in the interest of pushing forward towards Stripe 1, we spend one action point moving the first group to Stripe 2, which leaves us one action point left. Moving into Stripe 5 immediately activates the event marker, which turns out to be a 5. When we look at the event table again on the mission sheet, we see that a 5 places a light machine gun unit on a building on the previous stripe. We then select a German light machine gun unit and place it on the building terrain feature on stripe 4, since stripe 4 is the previous stripe to stripe 5. Had there not been a building already present, we would have had to have added a building counter to the stripe. The building now provides a plus 2 modifier to the target number of the German unit. We have one action point left, which we use to activate Group 1 to attack German Unit B, both groups of which are in Stripe 5. First, we calculate the target number for the German unit. As before, we consult the German Army Sheet to see the rifle unit has a target number of 6. Because the German unit was not attached to the tree for cover, and there is no base terrain counter, there are no additional defense modifiers, so the total target number is 6. Each friendly unit in the activated group gets one die roll against the unit of its choice in the selected enemy group. Since there is only one enemy unit, each friendly unit will get one die roll against this unit. The first firing friendly unit is Unit A, who has a submachine gun. Per the army sheet, Unit A can only fire in range zero, which means it has to be in the same stripe as the target. The army sheet also shows the submachine gun has a combat factor of three. In this turn, there are no additional die roll combat modifiers. Unit A rolls a 2 and adds the combat factor of 3, which has a final result of 5, so there is no hit. Next, the light machine gun gets to fire. Again, you would consult the army sheet to show that the light machine gun has a range of 2 and a combat factor of 1. There are no modifiers. The army sheet also shows that the light machine gun has an area effect of 2, which means this unit can roll one attack die against two different targets in the same group. If there is only one target, then the unit can only execute one attack. Combat is always directed against a single group, so the area effect cannot be carried over to another group. The light machine gun unit rolls a 5, which is added to the combat factor of 1, resulting in a total of 6. This is a hit, and one suppression marker is placed on the targeted unit. When a unit is suppressed, it can still move and fire, but there may be negative modifiers involved. Next, Rifle Unit C gets to fire. It rolls a 6, which added to its combat factor of 1 results in a total of 7. This is greater than the target number of 6, so another suppression marker is applied to the target. When a unit receives two suppression markers, it is removed from the game. In the preceding combat, we used each unit to fire once at the target. However, since we had a leader in the group, we had two additional options to conduct the attack. The leader can direct an attack of any single unit in its own group to provide a plus one die roll modifier. This includes an area effect weapon, so a plus one die roll modifier could be added to each target of the light machine gun. For this reason, a leader is useful in directing support weapons. Since there was only one enemy unit, however, we elected to allow each unit to fire because if the leader directs fire, it forfeits its own attack roll for that turn. The second leader option was to form a fire group, which means the group only attacks one enemy unit with a single die roll, but gets to add all of its combat factors to the roll. The leader forfeits its roll for that turn, meaning it does not get to make its own attack roll. For fire group attacks only, if you roll a 1, the attack fails regardless of any combat factors or modifiers. Since there are no remaining action points, we move to the next step, which is the enemy presence check. There are fewer than two enemy units on the map, so we roll a die and receive a 5. The 5 result has no effect. 
We then proceed to the enemy forces activation step. In this step, we roll one die for each enemy unit on the map. In this case, we roll a one. Since there are no suppressed units in the attacking group, the light machine gun attacks the nearest target group, which is in stripe five. We now have to roll a die and check the target table. Since we know which group is being attacked, we only have to roll for the individual unit being targeted. However, since the German light machine gun has an area effect of two, it can attack two units. So we roll two dice and consult the unit section of the target table. The enemy attacker rolls a six and a one. Per the target table, the unit will fire at unit A, which has the highest combat factor of three, and the one result directs the other attack to one of the rifle units. Since all of the friendly units have the same target number of six, we will designate one of the weakest units in the group as the second target. Now that the targets have been designated, the enemy unit can now attack. The German unit rolls a die against friendly unit A. The result is a 5, which is added to the German's combat factor of 2, resulting in a final result of 7. Since 7 is greater than the 6 target number of unit A, it scores a hit and a suppression marker is placed on the target. The German unit then rolls against the rifle unit and gets a 2. So the die roll of 2 plus the combat factor of 2 equals an attack of 4, which is less than the target number of 6, so there is no hit. So if there is only one active enemy unit, the enemy force's activation is over. We then move the turn marker to 8 and start a new game turn. During the group creation step, we can reform groups within their stripes. At this point, we decide not to change any formations. We then move to the friendly unit's activation step. We roll three action dice, which result in a six, two, and three. We must discard ones and twos, but we did roll a six, which provides one bonus action point. The three gives us one regular action point. If we consult the unit activation table, we see that we can move a group one stripe and gain one recon point. On the same unit roster card, there is also a chart for recon points. Recon points can be spent for different actions, such as rerolling a die and modifying an attack roll. Unlike action points, the rulebook does not state that recon points must be used on the same turn they are acquired, or else be lost for future use. Therefore, they can be saved and used on future turns. Some missions require the use of recon points. Since we want to attack the German unit in Stripe 4, we will move Group 1 to Stripe 4 using a bonus action point, which will also give us one recon point. You can keep track of your recon points by placing a die on the recon box on the unit roster card. Recall that the small machine gun unit A has a range of zero, so if the group had attacked from strike five, unit A would not have been able to fire that turn, but may have chosen to use a leadership effect. Also note that suppressed units can still move and fire, but there is a negative one die roll modifier for units that are attacking but suppressed. We still have one action point, but moving into the stripe immediately triggers the event marker, which we will have to reveal next. The event marker is 7. According to the event table on the mission sheet, heavy rain causes a negative 1 die roll modifier to combat, except at range 0. Since we will be attacking at range 0 in the same stripe, we will not have to apply the modifier at this time. Now let's spend our last action point to activate group 1 to attack the German unit. The German unit is attached to the building, which has a plus two modifier to the target number of six, providing a final target number of eight. Each of our units gets to roll one die to attack the enemy unit. We will use unit D riflemen for the first roll. Recall that units C and D were each assigned a grenade at the beginning of the mission. Once a grenade is used, we can cross it off the unit roster card. Unit D will use its one grenade to attack. A grenade can only be used at range zero instead of the standard attack roll. It has an area effect of three, meaning it can attack up to three units in the target group. Or, the grenade can be used against a single target to add the grenade combat modifier to the weapon combat modifier. Since there is only one targeted unit, we will use the plus two grenade modifier instead of the area effect option. The grenade modifier is listed on the combat modifier chart. Unit D rolls a five, which added to its combat factor of one, and the grenade combat factor of plus two results in an eight, which is equal to or greater than the target number of eight, so the enemy unit received a hit. We then place a suppression marker on the hit unit. Rifle C also uses its one grenade and rolls a two. 
So 2 plus its combat factor of 1 and the grenade modifier of plus 2 only results in a 5, which is less than the target number of 8, so there is no effect. Since the leader unit A would have a negative die roll modifier to its attack roll since it is suppressed, it decides to use its leadership effect and add a plus one die roll modifier to the light machine gun unit J. Unit J rolls a six, which added to the combat factor of one and the leader's modifier of plus one results in an eight, which is equal to the target number of the enemy. This results in a second suppression marker, which means the enemy unit is removed from the battlefield. We next move to the enemy presence check. Since there are fewer than two units on the map, we must roll a die. We roll a 2, which has no effect per the enemy presence table on the mission sheet. We then move to the next step, enemy forces activation. Since there are no active enemy units on the map, we can move to the last step and advance the turn marker to 7. We are now ready to begin a new turn. Since we do not need to regroup any units, we can proceed to the friendly units activation step. This time we roll three action dice resulting in two twos and one five, giving us only one action point this turn. We will use our one action point to use the recover action in order to attempt the removal of the suppressed marker from unit A. There must be a leader in the group to attempt recovery unless you spend a bonus action point. We may roll for the recovery of any suppressed units in the selected group. The cost is one action point if the leader is in the group, and one bonus action point if the leader is not in the group. To attempt recovery, we roll one die. If the result is three or more, the suppressed marker is removed. In this attempt, we roll a five so we can remove the suppressed marker. We now move to the enemy presence check. Since there are fewer than two enemy units on the map, we roll one die and get a one. According to the enemy presence table, there is no effect. Since there are still no active enemy units on the map, we can move past the enemy forces activation step. We then advance the turn marker to 6 and prepare for the next turn. So at this point in the game, we have 6 game turns remaining to reach Stripe 1 with our units. The mission sheet does not specify how many units must reach Stripe 1, so you will need to decide if all of your remaining units must reach Stripe 1, or if at least one unit will suffice for success. These sample turns have covered most of the basic gameplay. There are still seven more missions you can play individually or as a campaign. You should also be able to replay mission one because the terrain and event markers will change from game to game, and the various mission tables should provide variation as well. Now let's recap the victory conditions and objectives. Keep in mind that each mission will have its own objective. In the mission we just viewed, you must get your units to strike one. However, in Mission 4, for example, you will be hunting for an enemy tank to destroy it. In all of the missions, you lose if all of your units are eliminated from the map or you run out of game turns. Here are a few ideas for accessories if you want to enhance your gaming experience. If you are playing on a dining room or coffee table, you may want to invest in a game mat. They are relatively inexpensive but make gameplay much easier. And of course, you can use the mats for a wide variety of card tile or board games. You do have to provide your own six-sided dice or obtain a dice rolling app, many of which are free from Google or Apple. And of course, a good dice tray could come in handy, especially in this game where you may be frequently rolling several dice at once. This concludes our review of Rifles in the Ardennes. Visit us at these sites and don't forget to leave a comment on what games you would like to see reviewed and played. And if you'd like to experience something greater than liberating Europe from the Nazis, stick around for our disclaimer. Coming up next. Oh, my God.